Hello everyone, and welcome to a new celebration. Seeing as we've recently hit 7000 subscribers, and how the community is still actively discussing infinite wealth, I felt this would be the right time to do another traditional tier list, this time round, ranking all of the major bosses from infinite. Now, to immediately address the obvious questions, yes, there will be spoilers, yes, this is a personal ranking, and yes, there will be a link to the tier list in the top comments, if you want to try ranking everyone yourselves. As you can tell from this particular tier list, there is a total of 20 entries, all of which represent a notable boss fight from the main story. So if anyone's curious about certain bosses that weren't listed here, there will be a brief segment towards the end of the video, where I will go over the final dungeon bosses and certain substory bosses. Most of these wouldn't fit the criteria I used to rank the main story encounters, so I decided to give them an additional segment instead. And lastly, we'll be covering the bosses in chronological order, with the exception of the final chapter, where we'll first cover Kiryu's half and then Ichiban's half. Mainly because I don't want the video to end on a sour note, and ooh boy is the final boss a sour note. So, with all of that out of the way, let's begin the tier list. Now, the first entry will immediately stand out, as it's the fight against Kuwaki who is a random Seiryu grunt we fight in the first chapter. The reason why he's here is that he's emblematic of a number of mini-bosses added throughout the campaign, but unlike them, Kuwaki has slightly more substance to him. While the fight doesn't have a dynamic intro and uses the standard boss theme called Sanctions, it does have a proper QTE in the midpoint of the fight, and Ichiban literally calls him a boss at the end of a dungeon, so blame semantics for him being on the list. When compares to the rest of this game's bosses, Kuwaki can only really go to the bottom of the list, but as far as tutorial boss fights go, this one was actually enjoyable, cause it lets you get comfortable with things like god breaks, proximity bonuses, and just experimenting while you still can, cause from this point on, the bosses will ramp up in spectacle. Alright, next entry, we're introduced to an immediate fan favorite, and someone who occupies a large portion of this tier list, the one and only Yamai. I will try not to go in depth on his character here, so as not to derail the video, but what is the context behind our first fight with him? He ambushes Ichiban and Eiji in a motel room, has a menacing appearance, and immediately makes an impression by further beating down Tomizawa. It may be a cliche to define someone as evil by having them attack their underlings, but it genuinely hits the mark here. Yamai is largely disassociated from everything, and just tends to default to the easiest way of handling an issue. So in the first phase of his fight, you will mainly be dealing with his underlings. Over the course of this phase, you will even have support from Eiji, via the use of his laptop debuffs, and there's also an absurd amount of furniture you can use to conserve MP which is a nice setup because all of this will be reset once Yamai makes his entrance, making this a really unique fight. And once Yamai decides to step in, holy hell does he make an entrance! He puts Eiji's laptop out of commission for a while, and we are introduced to the main shtick that defines every fight with Yamai. That being, that he takes two turns whenever it's his time to attack. As far as this overall fight is concerned, it's basically as perfect of a real first boss as you could hope for, and establishes his physical abilities succinctly. The OST Slugfest is an amazing blend of being menacing and catchy, and the fight has both a dynamic intro and an action segment towards the end. Again, when looked at on its own, this is perfect. But once you compare it to the rest of the bosses here, this fight actually winds up being an A tier. This may seem harsh, but trust me, we're just getting started. Next up, Roman, the corrupt cop we fight in Chapter 3. Frankly, there isn't that much to say about him. He's a very stereotypical antagonistic figure whose help we need to progress the story. The fight itself uses the generic boss theme, has no dynamic intro, but at the very least it does have a solid QTE segment towards the midpoint. As for the area where we fight, it, once again, has a ton of breakables, but that's essentially it. It's a very by-the-box fight, and the way we tie up his role in the narrative is as unceremonious as it should be. 
All in all, while I appreciate its practicality, this is still a C-tier fight for this game's standards. And then we have Dwight Mendez, the Barracuda Kingpin. Now, we do fight him on numerous occasions, but I'd argue that this fight from Chapter 4 is by far the best one. We have an amazing dynamic intro with Chitose, the OST Twin Machetes has a distinct vibe to it, elevating the atmosphere of the fight in really unexpected ways, and we have a mashing QTE at the midpoint to top it all off. With how effective the introduction of the Barracuda was, I was really looking forward to this fight, even more so due to Denny Trejo's involvement, and if this wound up being the only fight against White, I would probably put it in an S tier. Not only is it memorable with an aesthetically distinct arena, but it also serves as a great tool for humanizing Tomizawa, which was very much a necessity considering how he was initially introduced as an annoying swindler of sorts. So then, why don't I just put it in S tier and move on? Well, it's due to the subsequent inclusions of Dwight as a boss that really detract from the impact and finality that this encounter had. This is still a strong A tier, but sometimes less really is more. And the same applies to the frequency of boss encounters with someone. And speaking of, the next entry is the Yamai fight from Chapter 6. This is easily the weakest fight with him, as we have no dynamic intro, no action segments, the fight uses the generic boss theme sanctions, and it initially feels as if we're reframing Yamai as a persistent annoyance, rather than a cool antagonist that always steals the show. Now, obviously, they turn this around beautifully in the subsequent fights, but the only notable thing about this fight is Yamai's fascination with Kiryu. All of this is a narrative necessity that pays off down the line, but as a boss fight, Yamai 2 is a C-tier entry. And then we have Wong To, the commander of the Ganjo. This would be another miraculous standout fight in an average action game, as it has a proper dynamic intro, an extensive QTE sequence, and a daunting theme in the form of Giftiger Füllhalter. While the area where we fight him isn't anything to write home about aesthetically, the reasons for the minimalism that were briefly touched on before the fight actually elevate it more than I expected. So far so good, so where is the issue? Well, two things. First off, while Wong To seems like an interesting addition to the cast, the way he is just pushed aside in lieu of other antagonists makes it feel like the Ganjo as a whole were just introduced to have another three villain group structure, like we had in Yakuza 7. The Barracuda fall victim to this as well, but at least they were well framed as a really unique threat in the beginning. Whereas the only thing that the Ganjo have going for them in retrospect is the casino set piece. Which to be fair, is very much forgivable, considering how stunning our team looked in this part of the game. Look, I realize I'm going off topic, but that's the thing. When you look at Infinite Wealth as a whole, it feels like you could have just written out the Ganjo completely and likely ended up with a more cohesive story. And with the treatment of Wong To's character, even the impact that this fight initially carried winds up suffering. Beyond that, the fight also makes use of a notable crutch that subsequent bosses will also rely on. That being healing. I've said it many times in the past, but 99 times out of 100, healing just results in a worse boss fight, and a poor attempt at writing someone as a greater threat than they actually are. Nitpicking aside, I'd say Wong's fight is still a decent beat here, but I wish they did more with his character and the Ganjo as a whole, rather than depersonalizing them through the Palakana affiliations. Well, it's been a while since we've last spoken about Yamai, so it's a good thing that the next three entries are all about him. Hell, two of these entries happen in the exact same chapter. Alright, so let's begin with Yamai 3. No dynamic intro or QTE, but we do see a return of the Slugfest OST, unlike the second fight, so props for that. Now, the context behind this fight is kind of hilarious, as the main reason the forest is on fire is that Yamai went big brain mode and decided fire was the best way to get Kiryu and Ichiban out of hiding. Not only that, but the ending of this fight, with Kiryu coughing up blood and Yamai's remarks on how the mighty have fallen, is a genuinely crushing moment, leading to a rescue mission in the latter half of the chapter. 
the stakes around this fight massively elevated compared to the previous fight. And while there are no flashy action segments, the arena more than makes up for it. From what I can recall, you could use the fire as a tactical spatial hazard and inflict further burn damage to everyone involved, which includes yourself if you're not careful. There aren't too many instances of such boss fights, so that already makes this one stand out even more. It's a solid A tier through and through. Then in the same chapter, that being chapter 7, we have the first fight on Yamai's home turf, specifically in his own theater. It might be due to the home court advantage, but RGG went all out with this fight. We have a hilarious dynamic intro, both an action segment inferring to a healing phase and the QTE, and we have a brand new boss theme for him in the form of Kuki. Even by those merits alone, it's an incredibly memorable fight. Plus, the way his abduction of Kiryu is resolved afterwards is that point where you start adoring Yamai's character for reasons other than being a cool villain. Now, despite all of what I've just said, I still wouldn't put this in S tier, partially because the last Yamai fight is somehow even better, and also due to the abundance of healing in this particular fight, dragging it down. Thematically, it is hilarious, but the hostess is giving Yamai drinks and Yamai himself having abilities that will silence your skills doesn't make for a challenging fight, just an unnecessarily prolonged one that will lose its charm after a while. Objectively, this is still an 8 tier fight, and from what I can recall, it's one of the final instances of imposed healing phases, not counting the final boss, so let's just move on to the final Yamai fight. Yamai 5 is the best fight against our boy. Just looking at the context preceding and succeeding the fight, we have him offering support in combat and some great action segments being thrown in to boot. We basically become full-on buddy-buddy with him in Chapter 9, which is what makes the reasoning for the final fight all the more intriguing. Ichiban is just poking the bear as it were, and both him and Yamai remark how their conversation here is just cheap bait to get everyone to join forces against Bryce. But you know what? Fuck it. Let's go all out. We have a glorious dynamic intro, a square mashing QTE, the Kuki OST being back in full swing, and there is no healing to speak of. Keep in mind, this doesn't mean that this fight is by any means easier, because Yamai really stepped up his damage output here, but the difficulty doesn't feel artificial. This genuinely feels like a proper climax, gameplay-wise and narrative-wise, to everything we've seen of the character up to now. Even the setting for the fight is notable, as we were initially tag-teaming with Yamai while it was still daytime, and after all of that, we eventually wind up going all out against him in a barren street illuminated by a dying sunset. It's genuinely perfect. A well-deserved S-tier and the perfect culmination for his chaotic villain arc. Up next, Chapter 10, Sawashiro. I feel like this is a no-brainer, but this is an S-tier fight. It feels a bit unfair, considering how strong of an impression Sabashiro left in the previous game, but RGG delivered yet again. We have one of the best dynamic intros of the game, a stylish as hell QTE, with Joe wielding his cane, the OST being a remix of his old boss theme, this time being titled Brutality Rebuild, which is really bloody fitting. And if all of that wasn't enough, he cycles through three different movesets as well, all of which takes a completely different meaning and value when you remember that you're fighting him as Kiryu. I found myself constantly trying to switch styles as Sawashiro did, and made everything all the more elevating in retrospect. Lastly, even the arena that we fight him in is something you could easily see as the backdrop for a final boss fight, seeing as this is the warehouse storing secrets for countless influential public figures. Not much else to say here, really. It's just a fantastic fight through and through. All right, what's ne? Oh, ho ho ho! All right, so in chapter eleven we have the dual heavy machinery fight. I have no idea why it's here, but it is, and it's not nearly as bad as I originally thought. Now look, the fact that most of their attacks are AOEs is annoying. But at the same time, this isn't a poor attempt at framing a boss as a greater threat than they actually are. You're literally fighting two excavators, what the hell did you expect from this setup? 
everyone's pretty open about the absurdity of this and no one pulls any punches, which is very much appreciated. Especially with how the aftermath of this fight has us crashing claw first into El Dorado. It's beautiful. This fight technically has a dynamic intro, with the roar animation between the excavators, it uses the Yamai Syndicate OST as a boss theme, and while it doesn't have an action segment during the actual fight, the aforementioned aftermath leading into another set piece definitely makes up for it. Weirdly enough, I'd say this is a low B tier. It genuinely took me off guard, but at the same time, it surprisingly didn't overstay its welcome. Alright, and now we've arrived at the Jima fight. Top of S tier. If you place this fight anywhere else, you are objectively wrong. I want to make a separate video about this fight, as it's one of the best of the franchise, and shows infinite wealth at its genuine peak. In my review for the game, I mentioned how the combat here feels like an in-between of turn-based and beat-em-up, and when you look at this particular fight, it's essentially the crowning achievement of that design philosophy. The fact we finish off every Tojo clan member with a beat-em-up segment, as shattered memories surround us and the characters' respective boss theme plays, is perfection. And seeing as we fight each of these characters in multiple games, the choice of boss themes is an interesting one as well. For Majima, it's Receive and Bite You, for Daigo, it's Four Face, and for Saijima, it's Massive Fire, all of which are songs stemming from Yakuza 4. And if you remember how our reunion will happen in the finale of the game, this was some nice foreshadowing for another title drop, a la We Are the Yakuza 4. As for the technical side of the fights, we essentially have a more subdued dynamic intro as we scroll through the teams facing off one another, coupled with the coolest title track taking the shape of a triangle. We have a god tier QTE in the middle of the fight, the OST called Impregnable Triangle is something that warms my neoclassical and Igavenia loving heart, and the desolate docks used as the backdrop for the fight are a phenomenal juxtaposition of the warm vibes of Honolulu. I realize I'm not talking much about the narrative implications, but frankly, if you've been with the series for a while, you already know everything. So much pent-up frustration, so many fights between each and every one of these four legends. When you remember the gravity of their statures and everything that's at stake, this is the most cathartic outing that you could have dreamed of seeing. And the ending, with Kiryu walking away, left me completely and utterly broken. This fight could easily deserve its own tier, but for the time being, I'll leave it to Ness and hopefully do a more analytical view on the fight at some point in the future. Next up, Narasaki. The only word that comes to mind when I think of this dude is pathetic. It's actually entertaining just how self-important the Seiryu clan acts in this game, acting like they're on top of the world as they're encroaching on Tojo clan grounds, and Narasaki is basically the best example of that, thinking he is a genuine threat. Meanwhile, all I can think of is, do you realize how many foot soldiers, lieutenants, patriarchs and even chairmen we've defeated in the past? You don't even rank in the top 1000. And I appreciate that the game doesn't try to frame it otherwise. You're just putting a clown in their place, like in the cutscene where Kiryu first arrives at the former Tojo HQ. Now, looking at the fight itself, it would actually be a commendable effort if it didn't have to be compared to every other fight in Infinite, which, as you could have seen, are really damn good most of the time. Narasaki does have a dynamic intro, and we have a prelude to the fight in the form of fighting Seiryu grunts that leads into the minigun sequence. One funny thing about this is how if you're interacted with these gigantic pots as Kiryu during his first visit, he will remark how you could use them as cover in the case of a shootout. Lo and behold, we have a shootout later on. I really enjoy that little nod. The OST changes from perfect encirclement, which plays while you're fighting the grunts, to the generic boss theme while you're fighting Narasaki, which is a bit unfortunate and it makes the fight feel even less remarkable than I thought. I realize I'm being pretty negative on this entry, but frankly, it just passes off as okay by Infinite Wealth standards. It didn't even feel a bit cathartic because fighting this guy is the equivalent of popping a pimple. He's such a non-presence like his boss, but uh, we'll eventually get there. Anyway, 
Narasaki is a C tier. Now get this clown out of my sight. And then we have yet another disappointing fight. Dwight 2. The way they brought him back after several chapters of absence really took away from the initial impact he carried. Cause now he just feels like an average foot soldier, rather than the kingpin we originally saw him as. Also, in this fight, he will perpetually re-summon his lackeys until you defeat him, which is just as boring as a healing phase would be, and makes the entire boss fight a slog to go through. We have no dynamic intro, and the OST is the same as in the first fight, but at the very least, we do have a fun action segment with an RPG at the midpoint. The area where we fight him is sadly unremarkable, as the only thing going for it are the scattered objects that can inflict burn damage. Now, the issue with all of this is that you could have replaced Dwight with literally anyone else, just protecting one of this game's many MacGuffins, and it would have had the exact same impact. The only other thing to take note of is how Dwight will offhandedly call us all shark food, which is a nice nod to the upcoming fight in the same chapter, but overall, this is just another C tier fight. But then, as the final fight preceding the finale, we finally have Dwight 3. Same OSC, plus a weird Team A versus Team B kind of dynamic intro. You think we're off to a bad start, but then you look around the arena, and you notice a shark periodically chewing down on the edge of the boat. Yes, this is another case of environmental hazards serving as a double-edged sword, and it is fun. There's also a QTE where we chuck Dwight into the sea, only for him to have his leg bitten by the honorary extra party member for this fight. I remember being really positive about this fight initially, but when looking at Dwight's progression, or rather, regression over the course of the game, all it reminds me of is how we could never reach that high that the first fight initially delivered. While this is an improvement over Dwight's 2, this entry won't go any higher than B tier. Okay, now is the time for the inversion of the finale, and normally you'd think that the only true boss we fight in Kiryu's half would be Ebina, but I added an extra entry here because this segment is far too memorable to be omitted. As you conquer the Millennium Tower one last time, you will come across a group of former Omi Alliance members, people who were there for the Great Dissolution and the so-called Omi Feast. Beyond that, it seems that the harsh words you directed at your fellow Tojo legends finally got through to them, as Majima, Daigo and Saijima will have joined you right before we meet these ex-Omi men, meaning that we're in for yet another feast of sorts. Kiryu's newfound comrades take a backseat and let the Tojo 4 finish what they started three years ago, and the end result is flawless. Now, in theory, RGG could have just made this a cutscene, but no, they made a unique fight that can rival the best boss fights of this game, and I can't thank them enough for it. The OST called The Four might as well be considered as Destiny 2. No, not the game, but the boss theme from Yakuza 6, and again, it's just perfect. This fight may not have a dynamic intro, but it has the most beautiful action segments to finish everything off and seeing all of the moves that our dear Jimas used in the fight from chapter 12 now being used to help us is more captivating than words could describe. While this fight against Imai may not reach the highs of the fight in front of the Omi HQ in Gaiden, it still is a mesmerizing moment, and one I will gladly put into S tier. Now, this is a part of the video that I've been dreading. If you watch the spoiler cast on Leon's channel, you likely know my feelings on the final boss of this game, and while I did say how I want to cover specific bosses from Infinite in dedicated videos, I feel that Ebina will need to be a priority in that regard. It's not just that he's the final boss for Kiryu, but he's unfortunately one of the most flawed antagonists of the entire franchise. And I don't mean flawed as a character trait, I mean his writing shows a blatant lack of focus and direction. If I went into detail on this, this video would balloon to be over 2 hours long, so I'll just state the following. Enforcing importance through gameplay won't undo a lack of narrative substance. In any other series, this wouldn't be that much of an issue, but this is Yakuza we're talking about. From day one, 
it's been made apparent that the game's story is one half of its value, and the gameplay is the other. Ebina isn't presented as a hateable figure like Iwami. He isn't presented as a worthy adversary like Nishiki, Ryuji, Mine, or Shishido. He isn't even shown as an ambitious up-and-coming Yakuza like Aizawa. And yet Ebina piggybacks off of every notable trope that the final boss in this series had shown thus far, a number of which I'd already pointed out in the aforementioned spoiler cast. Him being Ichiban's lost brother holds very little value, considering their minimalistic interactions and the fact that Kiryu is the one to fight Ebina. The attempt at framing him as a threat through personally dispatching individuals like Sawashiro and Narasaki brutally from off-screen is a cheap attempt at passing him off as a combination of a brilliant tactician and a formidable combatant. The addition of uncontrollable cackling preceding the fight is a poor attempt at showing him as someone who'd become so unhinged from a path of vengeance and solitude. And plus, we've already seen far better examples of psychotic characters with far more concise and intriguing writing in the series. Everything about Ebina just feels like you're stapling together tropes without worrying that they may be at odds with one another. Like you're using an AI prompt to write the ultimate Yakuza villain. And it does not work. In an attempt to make him the very best in nearly every conceivable regard, the writers wind up with a colossal narrative failure by any objective metric. And all of this preamble is why it's so hard to approach this boss from a critical standpoint, because all of the positives from the final fight weren't used to elevate something that was already great, they were used to salvage a mess. This guy is given a badass dynamic intro, a mesh square QTE at the midpoint, and a QTE where Kiryu breaks a sword with his bare fist. The boss theme, The End of Denial, is the best in the game, bar none. And Ebina's moveset almost entirely consists of AoE attacks, while also showing a reliance on healing skills. The team tries so hard to make this an epic finale, but a character treatment like this needs to be earned, because frankly, you can replace Ebina with any random Yakuza member, and it would have had the same impact. If we compared him to the other final bosses of the franchise, he'd be a C tier at best. But in terms of infinite wealth alone, this is realistically a high B tier, when you even out the good with the bad. And now, to prevent any further rambling, let's jump into Ichiban's half of the finale. Fortunately, Ichiban's side is genuinely bizarre in every way imaginable, seeing as how the first fight we have in the finale is against a shark. The so-called Tyrant of the Tides is a boss we've been well aware of thanks to the marketing for this game, and it did result in an entertaining fight. We have a proper dynamic intro, something resembling an action segment once the shark beautifully collapses back into the sea, and the OST called Tyrant of the Oceans is a great menacing orchestral track. Mechanically, it's not really a subversion of expectations, as the only thing to take note of is how the tyrants will occasionally flood environmental objects onto the boat, which will hopefully help you out in the long run. Once the novelty of fighting this mammoth passes, however, all you're really left with is a decent boss fight, so I feel that a B tier is a good placement for it. But then we have the squid, i.e. the blessed leviathan. I'll tell you right now, I'm putting this one in S tier, and no, I'm not joking. Okay, so first off, this fight does have a dynamic intro, like the shark. It has a similar action segment towards the end, where the boss will collapse upon defeat. But there is one more interesting addition that makes this fight so great. If you're not paying attention to the tentacles, you could end up in an action sequence that will swallow up one of your party members, and if that happens, you will need to fight your way out by finishing off dormant ink sacs. This is phenomenal, because it makes you approach this fight in a way unlike any other boss in Infinite. And I know this will definitely show my Devil May Cry bias, but the amount of similarities with the fittingly named Leviathan from DMC3 was a beautiful dose of nostalgia for me. Plus, while we knew about the shark fight from RGG's marketing, I was completely caught off guard by this fight and the mechanics tied to it. Hell, even the arena where you fight the squid is absolutely gorgeous, and you can even take a swim in the cave after defeating it. While the boss theme may be the same as with the tyrants before, 
it still fits like a charm and elevates the fight as intended. So yeah, again, S tier. And with the mythical creatures out of the way, it's time to talk about the final boss for Ichiban, that being Bryce, the leader of the Pelicana. Now, while the cult topic is very on the nose, Bryce is quickly framed as a political manipulator under the guise of a false deity. Being a fan of Kurohyo 2, I appreciate that the unintentional nod to Nozaki Ryo's structure didn't become a crush for Bryce, as he goes for a more straightforward, hateable, opportunist type of role. This guy just wants money and power for no other reason than being wealthy and powerful. And he's pretty direct about it, even stating how the Palakana is a bunch of nonsense in front of his devoted soldiers. It's simple and makes for a satisfying overture to the fight. Now, as for the fight itself, it has three phases, and by that merit, technically it has three dynamic intros preceding each phase. There's also a brief action segment towards the very end of the fight, where Bryce will desperately pick up a sword belonging to one of his fallen followers. The OST called Impersonation really makes it feel like you're fighting an actual god in classic JRPG fashion, but with its utilization here, it feels like even the game is taking a jab at Bryce for starting to believe his own rubbish about being a godlike figure at points. Honestly, this is a fantastic fight. And the only reason why I'm not putting it in S tier is that there are fights in this game that are not just phenomenal, but are on a completely different level than the rest. Still, Bryce was a blast, and the fact we fight him in an arena where the slightest bit of fire going in the wrong direction could result in a nuclear disaster even reminded me of the end of Metal Gear Solid in a weird way. I love it. With the main tier list being done, we'll now do a quick roundup of any bosses that you may have encountered in this game that didn't necessarily fit with the rest of the list. The substory bosses have nothing major to point out, apart from the Tsujimaru fights, but I was grossly overleveled when I tackled those substories, so yeah, they were alright. On the other hand, as part of the bucket list, we had the pleasure of fighting two of Kiryu's old acquaintances, in the form of Komaki and Lao Ka Long. I adored both of these fights and the way they concluded, but the Komaki one left a lasting, somber impact on me, like the entirety of the bucket list, frankly. With regards to the final bosses of the three dungeons, we've had the Robomichio Rangers in Hawaii, the Amon clan in Yokohama, and various tough entities plus the Game Master in the Big Swell. Now, Robomichio was a mistake. I hate him and his mad midget five like acquaintances. They make for a challenging fight, but not a very fun one. So after grinding the big swell, I just returned to crush them into the dust. And it still didn't feel fun. I don't recommend going for this unless you're a completionist. The Amon fight, on the other hand, was honestly an upgrade over the last few in the series. I've gone on record stating how disappointing the Amon fights were in Lost Judgment and Gaiden. But here, you won't ruin the fight for yourself by figuring out the one gimmick behind everything. Here, you should obviously focus on Joe Amon, as he will resummon the other Amons you fought in games like Yakuza 2, 4, and 5. But even when you know this shtick, the damage output from everyone involved will perpetually keep you on your toes. That aside, I adore the fact that we go up against every notable Amon from the past, minus Noah, at the same time, and it really feels like the right conclusion for their saga. Now, there are some inconsistencies to mention like the fact that Joe suddenly looks like Shin Amon, and how we don't know why Joe suddenly turned heel, seeing as we technically had a truce with him as of the end of Yakuza 6. But the sentiment of the Amon clan being the ones to take out Kiryu, rather than some random disease, really felt endearing, in an odd way. It's a fight that I'll look back upon rather fondly, even when just looking at the combat by itself. As for the big swell, and massive spoilers if you haven't gone through it yet, here is my best to worst listing of each boss fight. The tough entities were a cool challenge and reframing of some notable story fights, and the game master fight ended on an, again, oddly uplifting note, talking about the importance of teamwork and how people today are hyperfixated on toxicity. It's a nice reprimand and lesson to keep in mind. While the Big Swell's DLC implications are unfortunate, the boss fights included were enjoyable for me. 
So I believe that's it for the list. Wait, wow, this wound up being another gigantic script. Bloody hell. But I mean, 7k is a big number, so we might as well celebrate it properly, right? Anyway, I want to sincerely thank you for all of the love and support thus far, and I hope that the material here is as enjoyable for you as it is for me. I'm not sure what the next upload will be about, but with the last few videos being all about infinite wealth, maybe it's time we try and cover something different. And hopefully a bit shorter this time around because my larynx is still causing me trouble as you can hear. Whatever the case, thank you for being here and I hope to see you again really really soon. So until next time, take care of yourselves and have a great day. Cheers. <laughs>